Welcome to Focus Fire Chat. Explore together. Welcome back for episode 94 of Focus Fire Chat, recorded live on July 28th, 2017 on Twitch.tv. A big shout out to the live chat here. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us. This is your host, Blue Crew 86 Alongside me, we have the man who has been said to have the voice of a flower and who sleeps quite a bit, Justin Sane 0516. Justin, you uh, ready for September to be here yet? Oh, Yes. So ready. Now I'm just having to go back and play the regular game and it's just it's a it's a bummer. It's it's basically what it is. Let's just <laughs> call a spade a spade. No. I yeah, I'm doing good. Been sleeping a lot, so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm real I'm well rested for this one. Okay, good, good, yeah. good. Well, be sure to let Mel know we miss her over on Twitter at the Wind of the Stars. Life has still been kind of hectic for her, so we want to show her some support as she's getting everything sorted out. And from the depths of the madness-inducing mind maps, we are joined by our favorite Gunter, the one and only Green Eye music lover. Green, hope you're doing well. How excited are you for September now? I'm pretty excited. I actually have a little story real quick. Okay, go for it. You guys know that I live in a pretty rural town in Kansas where there's not a whole lot going on. I actually ran into another Destiny player who's actually like really into Destiny, who's not 16. I was, I was that was a lot of qualifiers. That's a lot well, of Well, okay. Real Destiny player, not 16 year old. <laughs> who's Those are into the qualifiers. <laughs> in, who's really into it. <laughs> right. Who's into it. And I was like, holy moly, they do exist out here. I'm not alone. So, <laughs> Josh, alone. if you were in the chat. I, hi. Ow! <laughs> Thanks for being where I live. Yeah, we know wow. where you live. Yes. <laughs> Green, I actually I, I actually had the same type of thing happen to me this week. I actually gave out a card this week. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I had uh, – um, uh, ran into someone's wife who plays Destiny. She was like, oh, yeah, I play Destiny. My husband does that. He streams it. I was like, oh, cool. What's his What's his handle and stuff? She was like, I don't know. It's stupid. And I was like, okay, <laughs> well, well, here, here's my card, and he can get in touch with me th- these ways. And mm-hmm. if, he likes, if he likes podcasts, I've heard of a good nice. one. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, no, it was – absolutely like insane is the fact that it was at where my wife works my wife works at a spa and the lady who does my hair was doing this guy's hair who apparently she's his best friend it was just like i you need to meet this guy and she's like come here i'm here like this is josh he plays destiny and both of us were like <laughs> awkward little geeks like hi <laughs> and then we started talking about the raid and pve and stuff like that so it was all good Nice. And he was 17. No, he was like 35. So I was like, yes. That's a good age. My age-ish. Well, yeah. I'm a little younger than that, you old man, you. That was a little rough. Hey, you know. (laughs) This is why you drink the adult beverages here. Okay, okay. Let's. I think we've hijacked enough of this. (laughs) Well, I think we're waiting for purple to get back. Are we still? Let's let's keep it going. So, guys, I had a tragic event this week. Um, uh, Gavin's Gavin's bearded dragon Thor passed away this week. Aww. Yeah, it's sad. Uh, it's yeah, it really did. did On his Lo- birthday, did Loki kill him? No, no, Loki did not. Actually, I think it was the old father. I don't ah. know, but um, yeah, yeah, he uh. He was like 12 years old, which I don't know if that's really old for a lizard or not, but he was yeah, with us for five, five of those years. So he had a good life. He stopped eating bugs. That's how I could tell he had checked out. Because, you know, uh. eating eating bugs was what he was most passionate about. So once once he didn't have the energy for that anymore, I could kind of tell that, you know, it was it's time. It was, yeah, yeah. Right. Did you have anything else exciting going on? Because I've got a few things I could mention. Let's hear it. Uh, somebody from <laughs> our Discord, who I'd like to kick in the shins, <clears throat> pens, sent me a pretty amazingly awesome gift. 
Uh, he sent me a computer. What? Yeah, he sent me. <laughs> right. That's what I said. That's why he's getting kicked in the shins. <laughs> like, please pens, don't. Please why? don't be mad at me. Yeah, that was the first <laughs> sentence. That was literally the first <laughs> sentence in the letter. I mean, I have the letter here, and it's like, "Hi, Marley and Julie. First off, let me say, please don't be mad at me." That was the first whole paragraph, essentially. But it's like, a, man. It, but yeah, it's I've got a desktop, something that's more powerful, and I can record things, and it doesn't look like doo doo, and pretty the, amazing. It's wow, pins. Yeah, that's amazing. He's awesome, dude. Pins, pins is that's when when I say this, everyone should have a pins. Mm-hmm. Okay, everyone. Should, if you don't have a pins, you can't go out to the store and just pick one up. But if you come across <laughs> one, if you come across one, you've got to, uh, you know, you, you got to h- keep hold of that thing. You know what I mean? I just realized, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> um, yeah, I just kind of realized that uh, <laughs> uh, there, were yeah. Fra- there were some phrasing issues and, and yeah. mistakes were made. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I I had massive computer problems, and um, <laughs> Pins, Pins was literally like, uh, "You want me to fix these?" And I was like, "Yeah." He was like, "How much do you trust me?" I was like, <laughs> "Implicitly." <laughs> and, um... <laughs> Which is also the reason you got into the trouble in the first place. Yes, Not of Pins, but yeah, because of my childlike sense of wonder. But. Yeah. <laughs> And no. the other thing that crazy, crazy, crazy thing that happened this week because of pins. This is something <laughs> I've been trying. This is this is all because of pins. So this is because of pins. Like because of this whole computer thing that happened, I've been trying to get Julie to get a Twitter account. Oh for yeah, months. Is that why that for is months. that why this happened? Yes. Literally, the only reason she's gotten it was because she wanted to be able to talk to pins, not because she wanted to follow anybody else. <laughs> Not because she wanted to see what was going on, but because she wanted to talk to Pins. So, Pins, you are the man. You got my wife to to <laughs> sign up for Twitter after six months of me trying to get her on there. It's like, oh my gosh, this man it, is magic. Uh, is is that why a a really pretty lady with a bunch of pictures with you and them green followed me on Twitter? <laughs> yeah, that's why. It's not my creeper. That's my wife. <laughs> Although sometimes she could be creeperish. I did. Oh, I don't know if you guys know. I've got Facebook now. I oh know. yeah, we I know. saw that. I, I, I did. I added. Okay, welcome and to I, 2007. Yeah. What? <laughs> welcome to 2007. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome. We just got over Y2K. And we're starting to move forward. But yes. no, um, Texas is catching up. I actually, okay, so I didn't understand Facebook, so forgive me, but I think it's rude if someone says, hey, do you want to be my friend, for you to say, no, F you, and just like, click, click, you're gone, right? I thought that was mean, so for the first, like, oh, three God. or four days, oh, I just said yes to every friend oh, request. No. Oh, no. So, oh, no. So then, <laughs> so then I In the start next getting, week, he spent their cleaning yeah up the i started list. getting i started getting dms from this from this girl in like ohio and and she was you know at first it was very innocent and stuff and it was just like hey how's it going i'm kind of shy and I, i'm just trying to make facebook friends and i was like oh that's cool you know just from all my stuff with the show whenever anyone dms me i'm always like hey what's up i'm, mm-hmm. I'm kind of <laughs> dumb this you is know? amazing and and so so she was like oh you know nothing i just uh you know just hanging out what are you doing i'm like oh kind of the same and then she went away for a little bit and then a couple days later she's like hey what kind of stuff are you into i was like uh a lot i mean do you you want me to say everything that i like right now (laughs) (laughs) and then so 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 then this goes on for a little while this goes on for a little while and and then it's got to the point where she's like so <laughs> oh no! 
<laughs> so she goes, she goes, so, and this is when it kind of got creepy, single white female-ish. And she goes, so, hey, I, I, researched, I researched your area and I, I want to, I want to dare you to do some stuff. Oh gosh. And this I sounds was like, like movie stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought. And I said, like, like what? Like, and she was like, you know, like truth or dare, you should totally research my area. I said, and I replied, and I, I think I've got it somewhere. That sounds involved. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and this, oh, this kind of this kind of went on for like three or four days, you know, just like um, all this other things. <sighs> and 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 until some, I was telling a friend about it, and they said, "Oh, oh my god, dude, that sounds kind of creepy." I was like, "Yeah, right." And they were like, "You should block her." I said, "You could do that." <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> and then I blocked her, and then I blocked her, and I'm ever glad since, you how. <laughs> yeah, she hasn't said anything to me. That's because she's blocked. <laughs> That's how blocking works, presumably. Oh my gosh! All right, so in the guest co-host spotlight tonight, we are joined by the amazing lead archivist from our good friends over at Ishtar Collective, Purple Chimera. Purple, how are you doing tonight? I'm well. How are you? <laughs> I'm 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 oh all the giggles. I'm doing, I'm doing We've got good. The giggles. Oh man. Okay, so let's run through the intro real quick or try to run through the intro real quick and then we'll jump into the conversation. The topic of today's chat is going to be an in-depth look at the lore of the Defender Titan. I stole the summary from Green this week, so forgive me if I don't do it the normal justice. The calling card of any Titan is the wall. Defenders embody this philosophy, literally becoming a wall against which the armies of the darkness break. When people of the city think of Titans, it is the Defender that comes to mind, the wall that keeps the dreams of the city alive and safe from the encroaching darkness. On the battlefield, a Defender is a wall behind which her allies rally, a steadfast and sure warrior who will meet any challenge head-on and proved to be an immovable anchor for her fire team. A defender doesn't form a wall. She is the wall. When she forms a ward, she imagines the wall before her. She walks inside, wrapping it around her, donning the armor of the light that it provides and absorbing any punishment. The ward shrugs off her enemy's fiercest weapons, and as the walls hold back the darkness, the defender holds up the light. Before we get into that, however, I do have a few housekeeping notes. In our last chat, we took a look at Blade Dancers. If you missed that and have any interest in hearing our thoughts, please be sure to check out the new www.focusfirechat.com for archives of all previous chats, links to other aspects of Focus Fire Chat out in the internet, and a growing collection of community articles. If you don't mind, please give us some feedback on iTunes to let us know how we're doing as well as helping us continue to grow. As many of you already know, Focus Fire Chat is a cross-community gathering where the intent is to offer a week-long, in-depth view of a particular subject from within the lore of Destiny and other games. This chat begins every Tuesday morning and runs until the following Tuesday, with topics decided by the group via a poll that begins every Friday and ends on the Tuesday morning of the new chat. Every Friday, at around 10 p.m. Central, we get together to stream a recap of the previous week's chat for those who are unable to participate. Please be sure to also give some support to the other podcasts in the Guardian Radio Network, found at theguardiansofdestiny.com. These include Guardian Radio, the first and longest-running Destiny podcast of the net, Guardian One, Ghost and Echoes, which also has the Destiny audio grimoire, and the network's newest edition, a non-Destiny-focused podcast, Paragon Radio. Our next chat is going to be a look at the lore of Dead Orbit. With all that being said, let's go ahead and dive into the information and thoughts that the community had about the Defender Titan. Lorebot, let's go. Query. Grimoire. Database. Results found. Displaying on screen. Thanks a lot, Randy. I think the best place to start this chat is looking at what a Defender is. We have a few cards that begin to explain this concept. The first being... What is a Defender? Am I reading the stage direction? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> so, so, so for those for those of you who might not know what's going on, I'm forcing Justin to to take a little bit more direct approach. Okay. First thing he I says, Blue. That's not how I talk. And then I read it. From, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I read it straight off. Um. So I think it's it's best if we start with the Titan card, right? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Correct. Okay. <laughs> I'm over 9,000. Uh, yes. Titan. Strive for honor. Stand for hope. Titans are warriors. Heroic defenders of the light, channeling the gifts of the traveler to wage war on the darkness. Steadfast and sure, Titans face any challenge head on. Blunt force instruments of the traveler's will. There you go. Nailed it. Yes. Good job. Golf clap. Wait, what what is what's the what's it's IR Hunter? Titan. <laughs> it, it, is, it is IR Hunter. I is warlock. Titan. You're like, not the titan <laughs> like the Titans. Titan. Like the Titan couldn't muster any other words, just Titan. It's, well, it's like animal. It. It's yeah. like animal. non-Titan, because Titan go to Titan. Yes. Oh. Titan. I like it. Titan. 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 Oh, like, man. if Titan were a Pokemon, it would just say Titan. <laughs> so Pretty much, just, yeah. Titan, I know titan. that Purple plays a Titan. <laughs> Do you play Titan at all, Justin? I know he uh, does, yeah. too. I've got a I've got a 400 Titan at the moment. Yeah. You know, uh it, he's mainly the the product of a lot of infusing, but mm-hmm. I did there was there was a long time during uh the later parts of um House of Wolves when I when I ran Titan on my when I ran three different characters through Crota every week. So, I mean, I've played a Titan a fair amount. More than I played Warlock, for sure. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> but, I mean, honestly, how much have you played a Warlock? Um, actually, here lately, it's all I've played. Oh, In that's fact, true. You, the, you, uh, what is it, Sparkleface? Yeah, Princess Sparkleface has gotten a, a good run out. And also, when I went to L.A., just through bad luck or good luck, however you want to look at it, I, <laughs> I, every single station I played at the whole day was, um, was a Warlock. Well, I think that um, was the relief, re, uh, reveal. They only had warlocks, right? No, no. The crucible, the crucible stations had all three classes. Oh, they did. Okay, okay. Yeah, and also so did the strike station. So you just you, could, you just got the short straw every time. Pretty much. Pretty much. Mm-hmm. I would say warlock is actually isn't that bad for the second, as far as the build that for the beta and everything. Oh, and that's right. Because that they fixed play. they fixed the floof. They fixed yeah. it a little bit. It's still very much a glide, but it's it's not as bad as the first one, the first iteration of it. Well, and so in regards to the Defender, you know, Titan is definitely a good starting point, but let's zo- zoom in a little bit closer. Um, and Purple, I think I'm going to let you grab this next card because there's a particular man- or particular element of light that the defenders are particularly drawn towards, and that is the Void Light. So, Purple, do you want to grab the Void card real quick for us? Sure, Void. It's fitting, then, that we have weaponized the unknown. The universe is defined by fundamental forces. Beneath the world of light and matter lies the vacuum, and the vast dark secrets that it contains. In the understanding of this vacuum lies the secret of Void Light. I love the void. I think it's my favorite in the element type. <clears throat> absolute, absolute favorite. What I do think, you think. Yeah, Jay? I was gonna say. Um, I really am a fan of the void. Um, I don't know if I could necessarily nail it down to saying that it's technically my favorite because I, I kind of like all of them. Because uh, you know, it's kind of a synergetic relationship between all three. Um, but I think the. Um, the uh, the theory from Kex about what the void is, I think, is probably the determination of um, 
really where a lot of my agreement and like the the weight of void which is kind of an odd thing to say um but i think that's where a lot of my respect for the void comes from is because the uh that that particular theory which we've discussed in you know in detail in other episodes so i'm not gonna not gonna jump back into that one but um the mm-hmm. way that the way that he explains exactly kind of how like the void can interplay with with the universe and with the other elements in particular and then especially within the sword realms and um even somewhat of the defender titan um you know and then also we have a couple we had a couple different explanations of what exactly the bubble is and you know all that type of stuff that that was actually really really cool so uh, yeah i just wanted to to say justin i I know you probably had a oh no i just wanted to make the uh the observation that all the other super manifestations of the void are are these very um wild untamed things like when you think of the nova bomb it's it's the the warlock barely being able to contain this this nova bomb and then hurling it as an opponent and then when you think of the the dusk bow it's it's very much more like the when you look at the tether it's this like kind of writhing wild looking thing but the titan the 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 ward of dawn um bubble as you will as as it's called you know um it's a very ordered you know very it's it it's almost as if the Titan has been able to to uh, shape it very orderly just through his own kind of OCD need for everything to be in an orderly fashion. I, I, don't, I don't know if there's anything to that, but it's definitely the most tame manifestation of the Void we've seen. Mm-hmm. I think that speaks to the discipline of what a lot exactly. of Titans tend to have. But- but you don't think of uh, Zen focus when you think of a Titan. You think of a Warlock, right? That's what I think of, at least. Mm, warlock mm. is like intelligence and power. I think of more of them like mm. a wizard-like. So it can be very, very blasty, which Nova Bomb is. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. But... Chat, chat just explained the Titan. Our control of the Void leaves us no room for verbs. Titan. <laughs> Titan. <laughs> yeah, I love Hiko, it. Hiko did that. <clears throat> that's, that's awesome. Yes. <clears throat> well let's her- take that void and talk about it. yeah 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 go for it go for it talk about the actual application of it which is the defender the defender card says the wall against which the darkness breaks defender titans are immovable anchors trained to absorb punishment and control the flow of battle armed with unflinching convention conviction In an armory of void techniques, defenders block the enemy's movements, shrug off their fiercest weapons, and rally fellow guardians to strike back. It talks about being trained, trained Mm -hmm. to absorb the punishment, trained, they're immovable. They are soldiers personified. Right, and the other thing is we know with the Titans, you know, especially, and I mean, I guess Warlock's really... They each class has its own training mechanisms, but Titans actually have codices of how to do things like, you know, which is something almost you kind of think more of along the lines of a warlock because like the codex and all that, like how that all works. But Mm -hmm. um, like we know that the Titans, that's how they pass that knowledge down on that. And I'm actually trying to find... I had a link that talked about a theory about how the... What exactly the void... I think it was... I think it might have been Kex had the explanation of the Titan as actually punching somewhat of a hole into a a different... Alternate dimension? Yeah. Was it Kex or was it... I'm trying to find it. I can't remember. So Purple, you said last week that this is the one you normally play. Right? Purple, you're muted. Oh, I think she she had to take off real quick. Um oh, okay. She was avoiding you. I know. <laughs> everyone's been doing that lately. Gosh. <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, yeah I was it's... gonna keep that one in the holster a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, 
I think it's Kex that he was talking about how void light can be formed into shapes. Uh, he was using the void bow, but it, it's it's also applicable for um, defenders because they actually form a protective space. And and it you know in kind of like in the intro too, we we kind of mentioned this as well. But you know the Titans have always kind of been perceived as the wall against which the enemies of the city would break. Um, and you know you always. You have you usually usually people kind of picture a Titan either as a striker or as a defender, and that's kind of you know probably more of what your what your understanding of the Titans' role within the game is. I think that I personally, when I think of Titans, I initially think of um, defenders because they they're meant to defend the city and to uphold it, and it's always they've been kind of described as like that knight. Um, you know, the, the old time knight who protects the, the civilians and, you know, upholds honor and all that. And I think the defender, it kind of embodies that, you know, that, that is really, that is kind of what they are. They are literally becoming a wall against which they can, you know, protect those behind them. So, and I know green, I know you had pulled a couple, I think are these bounties that have quotes from Zavala. Mm-hmm. Bounties yeah. or quest endings. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, like attack and a defend. Defenders trained to personify both sword and shield at once. Talking about being both an offensive and defensive type character. Mm-hmm. In some respects... Okay, talking about just game mechanics of this Titan, and I know they, they're they fixing it with uh, Destiny 2, with the fact that of having the Sentinel, and I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later, more in depth, but the fact that this character was literally a post-it and shoot type character. You post up, create your bubble, and then dance in and out of it, shooting everything around you. It always became a little bit of a problem whenever things ran into said thing, unless you had, was it the Helm of Saint-14 that does the blinding? The best helmet ever, yes. Yeah, so... If you didn't have that, though, things would run in there and smack you because, you know, it's a shield that they can run through. Mm-hmm. The, I really wish, I know they fixed it for Destiny 2, but I really wished in Destiny 1 that they had the philosophy, yes, they're a wall, but taking that a little bit more direct of being the wall. Like they're putting, they have the wall that they can put down a short wall now, or they can put up a tall oh, wall yeah, that they can move yeah. around and be able to move a little bit more freely. I, they're fixing it. It's one of those things like, hey, Bungie, good job. You did it. Pat on the back. <laughs> <laughs> the Mohawk helmet. Yeah. The Romanesque. Is it Roman? It is yeah, Roman. it was kind of. It's yeah, got, it's got they, the... they stole it from someone, but it's Roman. It, yeah. Mm-hmm. We're not going to talk about that. Uh, mm-hmm. the, per- the perk that you were talking about is uh, Starless Knight, was, which was yeah. just an awesome name in and of itself. But yeah, I, that that helmet was so helpful because Defender was kind of my secondary character, um, really, because I, I always play more of a support type character, which is why I main Night Stalker um, is because it's a hunter that is actually support capable. But up until Night Stalker came out, you know, hunters were not really <laughs> strong on the support side like they were good at they were good at hindering I always things. felt supportive yeah, yeah we we su- would... we supported each other we or we supported the team um from a distance right you know we we always cheered them on from the sidelines mm-hmm. or, and then uh... pretended and pretended to be working i just took everyone's loot i don't know what you were doing um Mm-hmm. I, I play I play rogues, so I don't know what you were doing. Were you actually working, huh? Justin? Did you actually work in raids? Uh, you mean like actually do work? I yeah. always did work, oh. son. Okay, well, sword then. bearer, come on! Sword oh bearer, my god, sword bearer! Oh, gee. Yeah. okay, fair. We enough. always had to play sword bearer. Fair enough. If you were the, freaking, if you were the hunter, you freaking always blade got stuck dancer. Doing. But mm-hmm. um, I know when I played Defender, Helm of Saint fourteen was was my go to helmet, be- just simply because of the starless, um, <laughs> small wall, tall wall, all wall <laughs> from the chat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, but 
Right. And so in well, and that kind of goes back to what I was saying about the defender, you know, and we'll we'll get into this with the next kind of concept that we're going to jump to. But, you know, Saint 14 was kind of the proverbial defender. He was, you know, the 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 I guess when people think of defenders, they think of Saint 14. And that's mostly in in and from a mechanic standpoint, that's obviously mostly because of the helmet, but it's also because of how he was described, you know, within even the lore, he was always kind of the defender, like not not the subclass, but an actual in actual personality. He defended the people around him that he he you know, he defended and he helped people. And the cool thing about the Titans and especially the defender itself, and if you go back to the defender card you see that you you actually hear them being talked about as immovable anchors. Um, you know, they're they in green you kinda of mentioned this. They're the they're the ones that they set up a spot and they sit there. You know, that's but that's the point. That's what a defender is mm-hmm. supposed to do. And, you know, they're they're trained to basically be the punching bag for the entire fire team because they basically draw the aggro of everybody. And then when everyone's focused on this big purple bubble the other people of the fire team can actually roll in and flank. And, you know, they, the other people, they can boost, you know, the abilities of the different guardians that are on their fire team via the, the dawn, you know, the different aspects that they, they can manifest within that ward. But the main point is that they are supposed to, min- they are meant to control the flow of battle. They're supposed to be either a stopgap to help, you know, help prevent someone from coming through or they're supposed to be a strong point in which their their allies can fall back and rally into you know a protective space to kind of get a breath so that's that's just you know kind of again kind of why when i think of a titan i kind of think of defenders more than i think of strikers i definitely see i'm not saying that i don't see strikers in titans i definitely do but when i think of a titan in just general concept defenders is kind of usually where my mind goes just with the the personality that i've read of the titans i don't know yeah. purple it's purple, more the I know ideology right right and i know purple purple i think green you said that purple mains did is that right yes purple? i do yeah i i mean defender um defender was the first thing i ever played in destiny before i even had my own account <laughs> um And I I definitely agree with you. I think that um, that Striker came after Defender. I think Defender was first um, as far as the lore goes. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't I don't think we have proof of that, um, Mm -hmm. but there there are suggestions. Uh, We don't really have a lot of proof of what order the subclasses came in. in Yeah, I was about to say I don't I don't even know if you can really put it into an order. Because um, some of them clearly came after. Fair. Um, like there seems to be a shift um, when you read the um, t- the grimoire that talks about um, kind of anything that happened, like at the formation of the city, like Battle of Six Fronts, and before that. Mm-hmm. Um, Everything seems a little bit more chaotic, but also as far as like what ability is that? I don't know, but there seems to be a line where suddenly strikers show up um, where there weren't as many references to them before. And waning. Yeah. And the, well, and the concept that, um, that Shaxx would go on the offensive it seems to be very jarring um, to Saladin and even Zavala a little bit. So, um, which is an interesting thought when you think about it as in terms of the subclasses, because it's like, oh, well, maybe that means that um, the de- you know all, they were all defenders, and then sudden. I'm not saying that Shaxx invented strikers, but like. Um, that'd be pretty cool that going i mean that would be cool if he did but like you know this the just the concept that 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 a titan would go on the offensive is so bizarre to the entire group that that shacks is um affront would was like or his attack was like so shocking that it would cause such big waves and backlash Mm -hmm. in 
Here's literally, a question. Literally a shockwave. That, yes, exactly. A question that I don't think anybody's even talked about yet as far as do you think there were supers used before people got to the city? Yes. 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 We know I that. Would say so. Because the lords, the cards that discuss the lords of iron. Um, right, but before uh, people organized. Before people started organizing. Because, I mean, if you look at, because uh, they, when you look at Zavala's journey and the the release information and everything, you never see him actually use the super until he's already in the city. And they've already established it. I mean, I know that's not necessarily any conclusive truth or, like... Right. anything conclusive but it's an idea that makes me wonder is like okay did zavala learn it on his own i mean i know he had the power to be able to do it because he is one of the risen or run of one of the guardians eventual guardians but did he actually ever implement any use of the light before he got to the city and before they really started honing in on what they could do with the light i, I mean i would guess yeah but even even though if you want to say that Zavala never had any kind of advanced use of the light before he got to the city or made contact with the speaker, there there were probably guardians who stumbled upon it, much like, you know, superheroes from a comic book stumble upon their abilities. You know, I mean, it, it kind of happens by accident. And then, you know, you kind of test your test your limits and then you kind of test your new ability out um you you can't say definitively but i think it's it's i mean it's possible it's just a good thought experiment that's i don't think anybody's really asked yet is when do we learn i mean i know when we first wake up our ghost tells us a little bit more about it and we're able to utilize uh golden gun or the defender bubble or well, uh, but, even then, but, even then, it takes a little bit, though. Right, right. it takes killing some enemies and and utilizing your life in other ways, like like getting your grenade, you know, or mm -hmm. you know, interacting with your ghost a little bit. Well, because you know, think about when we were talking about Blade Dancer, right? He actually calls that out, especially um, when you learn how to use the arc blade, because he actually calls out the fact that he doesn't have the protection against the zap zap thingy. Um, he's like, maybe you should talk to Cade. Maybe he'll know more about that. Because, like, in that, to me, what it is, and uh, Hiko is actually saying that in chat right now, knowledge that you can use a super doesn't mean you can use advanced super techniques. So the manifestation of that power, um, and this is also, you see this with Wei Ning, right? Wei Ning actually has a quote when she's talking about how she can't really do the bubble, but she just, she mm -hmm. just like, um, it's, it goes back to the psychological imperative that, forms what class you are uh like there's there's this just and waning i think does a really good job in personifying that in that she kind of explains like how it just like builds and builds and builds and then she just has to punch something uh you see that with shin malfer with the golden gun you know and he has that very poetic the very poetic scene where he he summons the golden gun and shoots dredgen um, you know, he you know, talks about the passion and the, the rage as it flows down his arm. And it's it's not something that's necessarily controlled. It's something that that individual is, you know, it's it's a um, it's a threshold after which, you know, psychologically you have to push past this barrier and actually manifest something. And and it, I think it is different for every single guardian, you know, personally, I think. But I think also kind of tying back to. The con like kind of to go back to a little bit to purple your conversation about you know the the defender versus the striker and kind of the order there. I personally just see that a lot with um with a concept such as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, for for instance, like you're not going to see a lot of offensive movements because they were so busy trying to make sure that they actually had security. And, you know, Maslow, Maslow for, for anyone who doesn't know psychology 101 type, like, hierarchy of needs concept, uh, Maslow has a basically a pyramid that it's his argument is that there are certain foundational benchmarks that have to be achieved before the next, the next um, 
benchmark can even be attempted. Uh, Maslow or kind of breaks even desired, right? Or even recognized. Yeah, it, it, like you won't even really recognize this, and you see this a lot, even in in the real world. You especially see this uh, between the difference between, let's say, a first world country and a third world country. That's where the kind of the tongue in cheek first world problems comment comes from. Actually, is a it's a nod towards that ma- that hierarchy of needs. Uh, and Maslow actually has five levels. The first one is, is physiological, and then the second one is safety and security, and third is love and belonging. Fourth is esteem, and then the fifth is the actually the the arguably the most important one, but it's also the most difficult one. It's self actualization. But a lot of people get caught, especially within dystopian models uh, such as Destiny. A lot of times, that kind of hovers around that first and second. Because the entire concept of a dystopian uh, world is the fact that we have been yanked back to those foundational issues. You 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 see that within the development of the the lost or the last city. They were building literally. They were building walls to defend themselves against the fallen threat. So the they were so obsessed. You know, and again, I'm coming from this from a psychological standpoint. They were so obsessed with actually building walls that any guardian who was there, that was at the forefront of their mind. So what do you think they're going to manifest? They're going to manifest walls because that's what they're trying to build. They're trying to build walls to protect people. And so you're you're not going to necessarily see probably a lot. I'm not saying that it's not possible that a, a striker would be around. I mean, I'm sure there were. But the majority of Titans at that point in time were concerned with, and you know, also remember, Titans are the big tanks. They're the strong figures. What do you think they are doing? They are helping actually build the walls. You see this in the the um, reveal trailer, right? You see, uh, what is it, Ikora when she's fl- uh, flying with the bricks, she's, mm-hmm. and then and then you see the Titans, and the Titans are helping the frames, and they're 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 literally picking up the blocks and putting them together into a wall. So. If you remember, if you look at a class and a subclass as a, psych- a manifestation of the psychological makeup of a guardian, it makes sense that a defender would be more prevalent at the time of, you know, the ending of the golden age, or sorry, the ending of the dark age, the beginning of the city age era. Oh, and remember that the leaders that we know of from the early days of the city were have been titans as well. Radagast right. was a titan. Um, Rezl Azir was a titan. Mm-hmm. Now, so, Rezl, Rezl was... I mean, if Rezl was, time, he would be called titan. Right, no, no, no. I was going to say Rezl was more of a striker, too. I mean, I will well, I will just make that... Well, I, I mean, right. I mean, we've seen... We see in the Grimoire, we saw Rezl actually use a fist of Havoc. I don't... Did right, he ever use a bubble? I don't remember him seen. ever. Right. However, um, and this has been a debate that we've been going at in the lore community for a long time right of, right does someone have what like are you your subclass or are you your class you are you know, your like, class i i so, right um you know there are certainly people who who favor one subclass over the other just like the players right mm-hmm. might favor one subclass over the other but that doesn't mean that they don't have access to the others oh and i and i agree 100 percent that everyone has i think the the distinction here for me at least for so this is just my you know my opinion um my distinction is i think everyone has access to all the subclasses i think only a select few master every subclass um and yeah that, that's that signifies mastery right right and and that's what puts like the osiris's the tolans um you know that's that's what puts those figures at the pinnacle is because the it's not the necessarily that they had access to both subclasses. It's that they actually mastered it to a point that they were known to be masters of individual sub multiple subclasses. And then our guardian is obviously even more of a legend, arguably there because we not only mastered every single subclass, we actually mastered it very quickly in regards and and as far as we've kind of heard in regards to the other individuals who have done the same. Well, I mean, we talked about the defensive aspect of the defender because that's kind of the most obvious, but I think one that we kind of missed is the suppressive 
They have yes. those stinking suppress- <laughs> suppression grenades <laughs> that annoy. Fun oh, police. Can, I'm so Fun oh, <laughs> so mad. I get so mad. I am mad that they made it into D2, quite honestly, because I'm like, why, why do I have a super? I get it once a game, and I'm suppressed. This is dumb. I mean, well, that is something. Don't suppress your feelings. <laughs> Don't suppress your feelings. Oh, <laughs> I will let anybody know. I'm going to be running Fun Police. That's going to happen. I will play Titan just so I can run Fun Police. God. This, but are there any other classes that really have a suppression type no. besides Night Stalker? No. Night Stalker does have the tether, which is somewhat yeah, but they don't your hold. But they don't have a grenade. It's true. <laughs> yeah. The grenade is much more readily available than the super. To have that as a super perk is a lot different than being able to throw it every 40 seconds or so. Mm-hmm. It's true. And actually, one of, our, one of our dispatches is actually about the suppressor grenade. So. Nice. So, yes, there, there, is a, there is a specific question that is coming up from, from, our, yeah. the, from the emails. I've actually kind of got a little theory that the the suppressor grenade actually forms a void pocket around you that actually interferes with with um the transmission and reception of your light and that's what actually keeps you from using your abilities same thing with the tether mm-hmm. you're covered in purple slime pretty much i mean you're you're in a little <laughs> you're in a pocket of purple goo you've gotten slimed you've got oh, the man. nope on you gosh so, okay, we have suppression, we have the actual defense bubble itself, we have the blinding aspect of the defense bubble if we get that helmet on. What other aspect does a defender have that most other classes don't get? Well, um, it, the defender subclass has an item that another class, subclass has, but not the hunter None of the hunter subclasses have something that I'd really like, and that's a melee that grants an overshield. Mm, um, yes. <laughs> hey, you know Force what? When you give melee. when you have T Rex arms, you gotta you gotta give credit. It's, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's because they have to get so close. They have to get so close to actually hit people. I just want a melee on my hunter that grants an overshield. Is that too much? <laughs> it it yes. either needs to grant an overshield. <laughs> Or it needs to to start health regen right then. Mm, that would be nice. Do you remember the comic? It was a web comic. I can't remember. I don't think it was plays that, did, but it was the Titan that couldn't reach something on the shelf in the, <laughs> the wall, watching. Like, ah, isn't that cute? Yeah, actually, Hiko says it best. It says, "I." Steal your life and wrap it around me for defense. So yeah, and then the warlock it. just steals your life and gets his life back. the The Warlocks. warlock is the warlock is Shao Kahn. I mean, just, well, I, I personally I view the the void lock as a, as a vampire theme. He's he's actually um, got an ability called Soul Rip or yep. like Soul Steal or something like that. It's yeah, it's nom, very nom, vampiric. Nom, 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 nom. Very vampiric. <clears throat> well, uh, do you want to do you want to jump into who are the who are the defenders? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Who wants to take lead on this one? <laughs> uh, well, let's kind of go through who we talked about so far because we've mentioned Zavala. Mm-hmm. Mentioned okay. is uh, Saint Fort Saint Fourteen. Who else have we mentioned that we know that are defenders? I don't know if there's any ones that well know for sure. That that is that that is that confirmed, but right. um uh you could say possibly Shaxx. Yeah, and that's Maybe just I... because his his involvement prior to Yeah, and then maybe Saladin. Um, I'm sure that Saladin probably probably was. Yeah, yeah. That's, especially that's... given the just mentioned Saladin Shacks. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Too. Yeah. That, <laughs> that, uh, oh, that's a fun story. That yeah. difference in, that difference in philosophy, you know, yeah. um, um what do you guys think about Veltarlo? I I I see him as more of a, a striker, but I definitely also can see him in a defender role. Well, he was in, and we don't really know what this means, but he was in the Order of the Pilgrim Guard. The Pilgrim, yeah, and that's where right. that's where my my view of him as possibly as a defender comes from. But his his um his attitude. <laughs> towards the thrall is <laughs> yeah. definitely more of a run into the thick of things and get eaten than a set up shop and let them come to you that's true yeah that was the same with Wei Ning because when you look up Defender Wei Ning pops on Ishtar Collective well and I was like well Wei Ning is definitely a striker but, but... But wait, the reason, wait. But, but the reason is never wrong. No, but the, I'm not the, saying no, they're wrong. But the reason waiting pops up is because she's saying that she can't do the the, the bubble. She's oh, like, I try, I try, but I just want to punch right, something. Right. <laughs> yeah, I love that character. That's one of my. Have favorites. you ever got? Have you ever gotten a hug from waiting? <laughs> it hurts. Gotta get that waiting <laughs> hug. It, it hurts all over. I'm sure it does. <laughs> Was, so, isn't okay. that an armor piece? What's that from? Uh, waning. Yeah. I uh, <laughs> got a hug. Uni could probably tell us. He got oh a hug from God. waning. That was the problem. Um, um, so, so other than that, I don't know that you can confirm any other defenders. Uh, Silmar, maybe. I, yeah, I was, was going to say Silmar. Yeah. Silmar, and it's mostly because he was, what? what's his title? Lord the lord builder or something the lord architect mm-hmm. lord architect from the lords of iron or the from the rise of iron mm-hmm. is he the one that would he would build the towers and they <laughs> he would kept he down. kept building he kept building the castle basically i mean that seems mm-hmm. very defender to me <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean that's what i would do <laughs> it's he was great. the kid with the sand castle I, that's the exactly what i was gonna do oh <laughs> He was it the one constantly that, gets knocked over. Yeah, he's the one that builds the sandcastle right in the uh, the shoreline, right where the water keeps hitting it. And he's yeah. like, "No, mm-hmm. I'm gonna win." It's like, dude, you just no. <laughs> um, and then maybe Saladin. Uh, just yeah, simply. I would I would presume that Radagast. Um, he seems very steadfast. Like that. yeah, I can see. I can. I can. I mean, like I can see a lot of the early titans. Again, I can see them being at least Kaber. knowledgeable. Yeah, Caber. I. I can. Caber yeah, has you a know, I grasp. Can, yeah, def- Caber's defending grasp. Well, and also I mean, just the entire. And ages. he also, and he makes a shield from <laughs> Vex. Vex. <laughs> That's yes. true. I mean, I mean, the entire I, Aegis is kind of. A, <laughs> yeah, it could be. I mean. That would be a fun one to actually delve into a little bit more, whether or not the Vexy Vexness actually got to him, or if he actually was a defender, or just a disillusioned striker who thought he was a defender because he made all the Vexy Vexness fit together. So, I mean, it could be either way. Wow. He got, so, drunk, he got drunk on Vex Milk Stout and yeah, thought he was a defender. He's in the dark corners of time and thinks, this is my moment. I can reinvent myself. I can like, be a defender. <laughs> Like, I'm in a new school. No one knows me. <laughs> yes. I can, talk, I can talk with an accent if I want. It doesn't matter. That's what you're telling me. That's his mindset. Oh, man. That would be awesome, though. He shows up to school the next day with an Irish accent, and no one knows why. And an eye patch. He's just talking in a brogue. <laughs> And he's just <laughs> a monocular vision going on, and you don't know why, but he's new, so you don't question it. And he's right. also fashioned he's fashioned a shield out of lunch trays, and he keeps trying to shoot things at the lunch lady. Okay, Bert. I'm going to quit now. I hope we get more of his story. <laughs> I have a picture <laughs> I need a paper bag. (laughs) At each time, he just goes pew. Oh no! no. (laughs) That's just the picture of the shield made out of lunch trays. God, 
That took a turn. I'll it did. Yeah, <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, so I'm going to redirect. You ready? <laughs> Make Blue stop wheezing. If we can get him to snort one of these times, I'm oh going to be... Oh, my God. I might just fall you, out of you... my chair. Oh, God, that'd be awesome. <laughs> but, uh... If Caper is going to craft something and become something new, what about our Titans becoming something new with Destiny 2? Like, the, do they actually develop the Sentinel on their own? I actually have a theory I was about to say purple, purple Go. Cause... Um, so, my, like, I, I spend a lot of time trying to make, you know, whenever someone asks a question and someone is like, because video games. And then I'm the one right. who's like, well, but what if? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, here's my proposal knowing only exactly as much as we know about the beta and whatever. Um, that one of the things that sets our guardian apart is, you know, our unique relationship with the light in, in like year one. And we kind of had a thought that maybe what made us special was that we got access to all the subclasses and nobody else did. And obviously that's since been kind of shunted. Um, But what if when we start Destiny 2, in the first mission, we just have our regular, like, D1 subclasses, and then we lose our light, and then when we get our light back, we, as our guardian, is able to figure out how to manipulate light in a new way, and that's why we have different abilities, because we still have this, like, I can still make Word of Dawn but I can just do something else with it too. So it's not really a new subclass. It's just extra abilities. So I just thought like maybe that's something that sets us apart from all the other guardians. Right. I mean, I, I seriously think that we'll start with the exact same subclass that we started with the last time. I think that hunters will start with gunslinger. I think that, the now I guess Titans. Did you start with Striker? Or did you start with Defender? We started with Defender. Yeah. This... Okay. I guess that kind of throws that one in a monkey wrench. But interesting. Yeah, I can see definitely. I definitely think we'll get it broken up after we get the, our light back. I don't think we'll have access to all of our subclasses right at first because I think as far as I know, game mechanics is kind of a crappy pop out for it but i think for new people coming in to play destiny that they're going to do the same thing that they did in destiny one and kind of gate what supers or what subclass you can start playing right away what we didn't get to touch our second subclass until level 15 i can see it being similar in destiny 2 yeah i guess the only thing that would kind of make or break this theory from what i can think about is that the like in the beta when I went in and I started homecoming I could use the sentinel powers Um, but we were level 20 that's true so I think when we when like destiny 2 officially launches if I only have ward of dawn and I can't you know be captain cosmodrome then I feel like that supports maybe. I mean, the thing is, we don't really know because they're, yeah. unless Bungie just like completely goes in a different direction than I ever dreamed they would, which would be totally awesome. Just saying. Um, Good like, surprise. I don't know that it's going to be um, ever brought up in game. It's just my own little headcanon <laughs> that I try to make <laughs> things work. So, so, just so I'm clear. What, what you're kind of theorizing is we'll just kind of start with the new stuff and they'll leave it to the more hardcore story types to kind of connect the dots as to how we arrive there with pretty much the explanation that Guardians honing their craft came up with these new subclasses, right? Rituals. Right, yeah. yeah. Which which makes sense. I mean, because if you can only sun sing so many times until you're like, can I just, can I turn this into a sword? You know what I mean? like. 
I, I get it. You know, the, the defender, you know, I, it's a, it's a bubble and that's great, but could I maybe make it a shield and run around and smack people so, with it? That'd be great. So, I mean, I kind of see that. Um, I hope that's not the case. I'd like to see a more developmental approach to it, but. I guess it just depends on where, like where Bungie is going with the whole like our guardian thing, because they've kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, there was like that one um, card about when with rise of iron, where Saladin was talking about um, all the things, accomplishments that we have, have done and why he chose us to help him um, instead of going to like, you know, the Vanguard or whatever. Mm -hmm. So there are mentions that that is like what makes our guardian special. So that's like, is that going to play a role in the story? You know, is are these new abilities because we are the special guardian or are these new abilities because Bungie recognizes that its player base is getting bored and wants something new? (laughs) I want it to be where we get to the farm and there's a little green standing off to the side that goes come with me kind of person and he teaches us how to be like super super crazy good i want a yoda hey hey <laughs> listen listen yes appropriate <laughs> that is appropriate at this time it would be kind of cool though if we able we were able to kind of create our own subclass or develop it ourselves i also think it'd be interesting if we had like a yoda type character that would teach us Make us lift things with our minds and stuff like that, you know. Ride around on a, on a baby Bjorn. Yeah. <laughs> a reverse, reverse baby Bjorn. Reverse baby Bjorn. Uh, papoose, if you will. Um, yeah, you know, that's, that's, very, that's very possible. Um, and, and also, just this completely off-topic question. Am I the only one who's going to be completely offended the first time I walk past Shax and he doesn't call me Hive Bane? Yes. I'm going to be very upset. That's that's just part. I think all these questions, they're, and they're natural. They're just part of leaving our old guardian and that old legacy behind that we've created just from having played through all this content. We trigger certain things in the dialogue. And all that, but um, and I'm not real sure how many how many years after the events of D1 this this game happens. Um, I can only assume we're starting fresh. So it may just be that they're just going to start us fresh across the board and treat it like the beginning of D2. And as far as our accomplishments go, or uh, you... accomplishments, accomplishments, and um our integration to the subclasses. You know, when we started D1, it was pretty much like, here's a character and here's some subclasses. We're not going to go too far into explaining them other than some grimoire. Um, Which is acceptable. Yeah, which is acceptable to me. But now, I mean, it could be a very similar approach where it's like, hey, there's new subclasses. You know, I mean, it happens. Okay. Can I go? Go. go. Okay. For those of you who are in chat, Blue has been in Discord asking if he can go because he's going to go off on a tangent. So if you are not prepared for a Blue tangent, um, you might get an adult beverage. Yeah, I thought in meant no. Um. (laughs) Um, So Green Green and I have talked about this a little bit. Um, I think that... I mean, most most people will realize that I come at I come from a more psychological background uh, than than necessarily the other people on the podcast. And so, for me, when we talk about the transformation into a new subclass, I immediately kind of connected with the idea that this was actually a paradigm shift. Um, and so, what I mean by that, and let me let me have let me kind of step back and. Let's walk through what a paradigm shift really is. I've said it before. Um, paradigm is basically when we talk about a paradigm, it's in in layman's terms, it is a worldview. Uh, 
an actual the actual definition of paradigm is literally the distinct set of concepts or thought patterns including theories research methods postulates and standards for what constitutes legitimate contributions to a field um so what you see a lot of times is uh this is where you get things called paradigm bias uh or worldview bias and this is often very very detrimental in a scientific community because basically what this is doing is it's it's biasing your your theories and your results and your searches and your hypothesis and you, most people don't even realize it um and so a paradigm shift The argument that I have is that the evolution of the new subclasses can also be seen in the general context of a paradigm shift by newer guardians, our guardians. Uh, And this is actually reinforced by what is the opposite, which is a paradigm paralysis that the older guardians, namely the Vanguard mentors, seem to be stuck with at the onset of Destiny 2. So let me let me unpack that just a little bit. Excuse me. Paradigm shift. uh, They tend. So again, They tend to appear in response to the accumulation of critical anomalies as well as the proposal of a new theory with the power to that encompasses both older relevant data and explains relevant anomalies. So new paradigms tend to be most dramatic in sciences that appear to be stable and mature. Uh, There. Kuhn wrote actually that the success of transition from one paradigm to another via revolution is the usual development pattern of mature science. So to unpack that a little bit, a very good example of this is uh, the entire concept of the world being round uh, or, you know, even bigger, the world not being the center of the solar system from Galileo. There was a big that was a big paradigm shift. And there was a lot of individuals in, in multiple communities across the world and across the scientific community that just could not accept that. That was a very that was too much information. You also saw this with a lot of Einstein's theories later uh, with physics and you know all that. There, there was a lot of stuff that he proposed that just it people who are in a a a certain paradigm in a certain mature scientific community there's a way there's a rut that they get into and when you have a paradigm shift in those types of communities a lot of people can't get out of that rut you see again kind of pulling that back into the the destiny universe you see that with zavala with ikora with Cade. those three figures they are guardians that is especially with zavala that is what they are and then all of a sudden, the light is ripped from them. The traveler is ripped from them. They can't adapt. And that, that kind of brings me into what a paradigm paralysis is. And so paradigm paralysis is really actually the greatest barrier to a paradigm shift. And again, paradigm shifts are it's a necessary component of existence. You have to be able to adapt. So a paradigm paralysis is, in some cases, is it, it, it's the inability or refusal to see beyond the current mode models of thinking. So this is also, you see this also in what's called confirmation bias, which is the tendency to search for, interpret, favor, and recall information that is, in a way, that confirms one's pre-existing beliefs or hypothesis. So it's a, it's a type of cognitive bias and a systematic error of inductive reasoning. Uh, you often will see people display this bias when they gather or remember information selectively or when they interpret it in a biased way. Uh, and obviously, as you can imagine, for emotionally charged issues and deeply entrenched beliefs, the um, this, this is very, very prevalent. Like this is a very common event in the confirmation bias. Again, going back to the Galileo situation, confirmation bias was there very heavily. Jumping into something that we know that Zavala actually has referenced is that Sun uh, Sun Tzu, the Art of War. I, I actually want to bring this in because during the Art of War, if you read, if you've read the Art of War, there is actually an entire chapter that expounds upon the necessity of adaptation, adaptation, and it's mostly in chapter six, and. The, he talks about elements, and Green and I, this is a part of what Green and I were talking about before we got on the show. It, the elements are all equally important in the art of war. Each each element represents a, a new, um, a different type of warfare. And water is the element that he, that he utilizes and his, and his uh, critics utilize to kind of 
used as the element to show the balance of how adaptive tactics can overcome nearly anything. Uh, so basically, his argument is that the successful warrior or the successful army or general or who, whichever position you're talking about is the one that is able to adapt. And so I would take this and I would say, you know, our guardian shows that in that they are open to a paradigm shift in the evolution of the manifestation of the paracausal abilities of the light that they have. The Vanguard mentors, however, show the paradigm paralysis in their inability to do the same when faced with the force of Gaul and the drastic change he introduces into their worldview. So what that kind of means is their quote is water shapes its course according to the nature of the ground over which it flows. The soldier works out his victory in relation to the foe whom he is facing. Therefore, just as water retains no constant shape, so in warfare there are no constant conditions. And this points out the fact that over time, in order to be victorious, the soldier or army must change their tactics to meet the new forces that rise up to oppose them. So, okay, in regards to Destiny 2, what does this mean? This can be seen in the new subclass as an evolution of our weapons in the face of a new foe. Gaul and the Red Legion and the lack of light where we had for the most part unfettered access to the traveler and light in destiny when we were pitted against Atheon or Atheon the fallen houses and even the hives own pantheon I mean we we took on a hive god and won in the current time within destiny 2 we are rendered powerless we are we are slammed back into the earth we are no longer these superhuman figures so which which actually brings to mind another question or sorry, another quote from the Art of War, and that is, all warfare is based on deception. Hence, when we are able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must appear, appear inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. And when far away, we must make him believe we are near. And this is then followed by another quote on how to best overcome any foe. And he says, if your enemy is secure at all points, be prepared for him. If he is superior, if he is in superior strength, evade him. If your opponent is temperamental, seek to irritate him. Pretend to be weak that he may grow arrogant. If he has taken his ease, give him no rest. If his forces are united, separate them. If sovereign and subject are in accord, put division between them. Attack him where he is unprepared and appear where you are not expected. So, again... Think of think of the argument of the manifestation of supers in purple. I agree completely with you that I think that the new subclasses from a lore perspective. And I mean, yes, there is the whole well, it's a new game mechanics and they wanted to show off the new you know engine or whatever. But from a lore perspective, you can argue that these these new subclasses are actually the response of a paradigm shift in the in the role of what a guardian is. And this kind of really ties into a defender so it's not just applicable to the defender into a sentinel but it is as it is you can see it in that transformation and what i mean by that is like in the same way that you see the psychological need for defense by in the defender in the early iterations of the defender you see the psychological need to strike back and to not just defend you can still defend we still have the defense bubble but we also now have the you know whatever you want to call it the captain america shield or what however you want to identify with it you have that now and you can actually you actually take that and if you you know if you've played it which i assume a lot of people have played the sentinel by now but if you've watched it if you haven't played it you can actually hurl that shield at people so it is now a a defensive item that has become an offensive weapon and that is very in line with the psychological presence of that particular guardian, our guardian now, because now we are actually responsible for not just defending civilization. We're not just responsible for defending humanity. We're responsible for taking back our light. And that is a very big issue within the destiny Two thing, because you know, they, they've introduced it a world without light. So, that's the entire psychological need at this point for all of us is we need to take that back. So that, that that's kind of where my, that's a very condensed version of my thoughts on the whole Sentinel thing, uh, purple and yes, uh, purple. Sorry. I, I didn't realize, um, if you want to know more about confirmation bias, purple actually does have an amazing, and I've actually everyone on our podcast, I've badgered to listen to this episode. Um, it is something that is 
I'm very familiar with from my time doing uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, psychological research. But she actually has, I think, is it 10, 15 minute episode? Yeah, it's pretty short. Uh, it's as one far of as podcast goes. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, it is actually an amazing episode that actually talks about confirmation bias in regards to researching, uh, in particular, video game lore. But it's it's applicable to any type of research. It's something that if you are interested in research, or if you already do research, and you know you just want this kind of thing to be aware, everyone needs to be aware of confirmation bias. Um, if you think that you don't have confirmation bias, that's probably a pretty good strength that you're a pretty good sign that you do have confirmation bias. Uh, because, uh, it, it's, it's a, um, it's actually an argument from a phenomenological standpoint. Uh, phenomenology is a, a school of philosophy that argues that everyone has a perspective. Um, it's actually one of the founding tenets of focus fire, uh, is that my argument is that the more people you get into a conversation, the more conversations or the, the, the more robust conversation becomes because everyone has a better or a greater number of perspectives. And that makes the image that you're looking at a better, better rounded image. It's more of a three dimensional. It brings it into sharper clarity. And so if you don't think you have, or if you don't think you have confirmation bias, you do. You just need to identify what it is. And in purple, I'm, I'm sure you can probably go into a little bit more detail. But yeah, definitely, definitely give that a listen to if you're at all interested in looking into anything. Yeah, I mean, it's basically the result of it. An emergent is um, when you look around the lore community and you see that everyone has different theories about things. And, you know, while I think... You know, I think the queen is a good person. I think the queen is evil, right? Well, we we all have the same information, right? We have all had the same interactions with her. We all have the same grimoire cards and the same quotes, but we read them in different ways. And part of that is because we're different people, but that's because we have, and so because we're different people, we have different perspectives and therefore we're biased against people who, um, who say certain phrasing or we interpret <laughs> phrasings in different ways. And so um, it causes us to color our view um, and all it, all recognizing your bias is, is just like learning what your bias is and recognizing that it exists and being able to recognize it when it emerges in your research so that you can c- compensate for it. Um, sometimes it's really useful. Um, sometimes you need it to focus your research if you have a ton of information. For example, if you were going to do research on uh, President Theodore Roosevelt, I mean, there's a lot of information about him, right? You can't just do Theodore Roosevelt. Like, you have to narrow it down a little bit more. (laughs) Um, So then in that way, you will have bias against the research. Because you only want research about, you know, when he was president, or you only want to research about um, his hunting practices, or, you know, his childhood, or whatever your focus is. So, um, there, it's it's good and bad, but it's always there. <laughs> Green, go for it. Uh, actually, you go for it because okay. I forgot what mine was for. <laughs> I was just going to jump in real quick and um, purple. I, you, you kind of already said it, but I was going to say that is not to say that having a bias is a bad thing. Having a bias is human. It's, it's a human thing. Um, yeah. And you, you, you should not feel, I'm trying to figure out how the best is. You should not feel that having a bias in your research methodology or your your bias in your research in general or how you view things, that's natural. It's it's the fact that you need to, and Purple, this is kind of tying back into what you just said, is it's, it's recognizing that and taking that into account when you're doing research. You need to be able to do that comfortably and recognize that that is what it is. So that's that's what that was what I just really quickly wanted to jump in, Green. Go for it. Right. I remember what it is now. Um, It's the whole thing that most people tend to have problems with nowadays is the fact that a lot of what we interpret 
with destiny with the grimoire itself is based in text and when you read text you can read text a lot of different ways think of it as an actor when you read through something you read it with a different tone you're going to set off a different emotion you can read the same line over and over and over with multiple tones it's how the shakespearean actors get really really good at what they do is they read it in every single emotional tone that they can think of and so when we read grimoire, if you have a, an idea in your head that uh, the queen's brother is a complete and utter, utter jerk, everything you read that he says in game is going to sound like a complete and utter jerk because you already have that in your head. So you're just going to com- continue to really cycle. And unless you go through and like uh, Purple was saying, kind of, adjust yourself a little bit and try reading it in a different way try reading it in a different light you can you can start seeing things in different ways and maybe not necessarily change exactly what your view is but see if there's another way that could be interpreted do you think justin oh justin i think your mic is oh oh sorry sorry I was clearing my throat and I muted myself. Um, no, I was just going to say to to kind of circle back around to what Blue was saying about how a bias is oftentimes there's a negative connotation with a bias. Uh, that's, I think, largely because people have a hard time separating a, bri- a, a bias from a prejudice, which yeah. a, a prejudice can be a negative thing. It's not, it's, Oftentimes, just like a bias, it it can also not be a negative thing. But, um, you know, basically, and and blue and and purple and all the other colors will tell me if I'm wrong here. (laughs) Um, But uh, the the basic difference between a prejudice and a bias is that a bias is like a, a, a generally held thought that an individual has or a group that it's it's kind of influenced by their area of life um like their politics their religion things like that while a prejudice is much more about like the the processes they use to make a decision or the processes by which they judge things so there's a difference there between the two <laughs> that's the that's the the very cliff notes version of prejudice versus bias but okay. Uh, is is that at least close? Yeah, bias. Well, it yeah, uh, yes and no. Bias is actually a prejudice in favor or against one thing. So bias is a prejudice, um, mm-hmm. kind of. It's it, but like, and you're you hit it on the head. You, it, it's a word that has a lot of negative connotation, um, and depending on how it's used, that might not necessarily be accurate. Um, yeah. now biases, so you, you say prejudice, prejudice is actually the more neutral term bias is actually usually considered to be unfair. Um, so you'll see like, uh, within, within the scientific community, or at least within the psychological scientific community, when you talk about, uh, bias and confirmation bias, that is seen as a negative thing. You often like readers okay. would, readers would say a paper is biased towards, you know, a certain thing or biased, or there was evidence for biased against, you know, whatever that's a, it, bias is usually used in a negative connotation. Prejudice, prejudice has started to become used in the negative, but, um, yeah, I mean you're you're right. They it is a there is a very strong connotation. <laughs> there is a bias in the the use of these terms, which is mm-hmm. I I don't know that it's funny to have to say that there is a prejudice in the way that you use prejudice. Um but <laughs> it's true. I mean it is. It's true. And so that's why sometimes and and you know and that actually is the other explanation of why scientific research papers are so sometimes difficult to read is because they're having to write that way so that they don't appear to be biased but they have to be careful that the bias and the way that they present is not like you have to like when you're writing a thesis and when you're writing papers you have to be so so careful about 
not just the bias of yourself, but also the bias of the audience in which you're presenting to, if that makes sense. So this is kind of like the whole place I was taking this to is, and, and actually I had this in my, my own experience, not through writing papers and such, but through the basic process of troubleshooting is that what I'm kind of getting from this, this confirmation bias is you should work to disprove your bias, not to prove it. Or it you is, should... it is more, um, again, yes and no. Uh, you, you don't necessarily have your bias. It's like a stereotype, right? Uh, stereotypes are again, negative connotation, not necessarily a negative thing. A stereotype could be arguably a survival trait. Um, a bias is kind of the same. Yes. You should try to disprove your bias. It's not only is it probably a healthy intellectual exercise. Um, it actually forces you to use your brain, um, in a way that is, is, um, maybe counterintuitive to your, your paradigm. Um, and that's and that's a good thing. Like even if it is a wrong answer, it is good to challenge yourself to to find out why you think that way, right? And Green, I know you probably have something. Right. It's, it kind of goes back to what Purple said from an education perspective. Um, confirmation bias is a gr- is something that we use. Um, our brains is our brains are great at categorizing. That's how we disseminate information as we assign categories. That's why we have stereotypes. That's why we have so many different um, aspects that we label because we want to put things in boxes. Our brains naturally work that way. So when you get a a whole list of information and you're looking through everything, your brain automatically says, I'm going to look for this. I'm going to say, if you're researching and you have a bunch of grimoire cards pulled up, like I pulled up everything from that the ghost said the other day, because I've been kind of pulling quotes from all the ghosts and you're scanning through all these different things. And I'm literally, my bias is I'm looking for a quote quoted by a ghost or said by a ghost type thing. That is a way that my brain can actually categorize. Now to take that into confirmation bias, when you're researching and trying not to be biased, you have, like you said, you kind of have to force yourself to say, Yes, I, I'm looking for this, I'm researching this, but I'm going to take other things into consideration and pull other aspects into it. That way you're not just saying, I'm going to look at it from one side of the coin and not look at the other side, because there's always going to be a second side. Right. Well, and in um, in scientific studies, um, we see this very, very clearly in um, like uh, studies about medicine where they have the double blind study um, Yay, double because, blind studies. because you don't want you, the scientists confirmation bias to emerge and show something that isn't um, that isn't necessarily true right um, you don't want the the researchers to sway the subjects in any way Um, So that's why we have double blind studies. Um, But, but confirmation or bias in general, like a simple example of it not necessarily being bad. I have a bias toward the flavor of caramel flavored desserts. If I see a caramel flavored dessert, I am much more likely to choose it over any other flavor. Mm -hmm. Okay. (laughs) As it should be. Simple, simple example of, like bias not necessarily being bad. I'm not, I'm biased for something, right? Rather than biased against something. Um, so you have to pay attention to both sides when when you're researching a topic and trying to find, especially when you're trying to find an answer. Oh, because uh, of the clustering illusion. Yes. Sorry, that's, yeah. Uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's a form of a, a, what is it? Is it technically, is it considered... It's, I know it's considered to be the beginning stages of schizophrenia, apophania, which is basically the tendency to at, attribute meaning to perceived connections or patterns between seemingly unrelated things, i.e. the entire focus fire chat. <laughs> and actually, <laughs> actually, like- I'm going to I'm going to expand that. That's probably that that explains like the majority of the Destiny lore community is Pretty finding much. finding yeah. connections or patterns between seemingly unrelated things. 
So that's like what the guy in uh, A Beautiful Mind had when he was yes. uh, well, saying yeah, yeah, pieces kind of. of yarn from different things to different things to all across his room. Well, isn't that kind of sort of what Sherlock had as well? Yes. But that's what made him so effective. Oh, God. Exactly. I mean, it's it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, well, obviously, you don't want to get the schizophrenia. <laughs> but the the ability to what you started saying chunking or categorizing yeah clumping it's it's clumping or chunking it's all an actual mental function that we use to disseminate information it's something you use all the way through school isn't, you start learning it at a very very young age how to do also isn't that phenomenon the birth of superstition like mm. pretty much like that's like mm. you you associate one thing with another oh i see what you're saying uh i i, I you could probably make an argument for that i don't like, know if that like, would i would agree with it but you could probably make an argument for it like why does the indian raid dance work because you don't stop dancing until it rains right <laughs> oh I mean, gosh am right, I right so we're, am I we're right? gonna we're gonna move <laughs> I don't. I don't even know. I don't even so know where to go from that. Yeah, I know. Defender <laughs> Titan. <laughs> Good job, Justin. You got us back on track. <laughs> oh man, uh, do so you guys do you want to hit dispatches? I was just or? about to say, yeah. The um, <clears throat> let me jump in here. Make sure I'm on the right ones here. All right, so we got dispatches real quick. Dispatches from the Wilds. All right, we actually got a couple, and one of them is from our good friend Potato, so I'll let Justin take that one when we get to it, because I know he loves loves reading those. And the 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 first one, though, is from... And Justin, you'll have to help me pronounce this, uh, this guy's name. I don't know if I can do it justice. Ma! <laughs> <laughs> is that the right one? Yeah, that's that the right time. one. That's the right one. <laughs> so, so he sends in. He's like, "Thank." I, I guess we interrupted a conversation between him and and Shatheon, uh because he says, "Thanks, Shatheon. Hi, FFC. It's your favorite Ma." So I was thinking about the Defender Titan, and according to Ishtar Collective on the Defender card, it says Defender, the wall against which the darkness breaks. So I got to thinking about the darkness and walls breaking it, and it made me think about King Theoden of Rohan escaping to the keep at Helm's Deep and making the statement, let them come, they will break upon this fortress like water on rock. That thought led to another. In The Lord of the Rings, there are nine rings of power and one to rule them all. Gandalf refers to them as the Nine, which made me think of the Witch King of Agmar, who is a black rider who wears a black cloak with a hood up. Reminds me a lot of Zur, black cloaks and hoods, crazy noises, Zur as a wraith confirmed. And then I thought in the books, they talk about dragons in Middle Earth, which made me think about Justin saying 0516. And I was like, boom, it all connects. Justin is none other than Sauron, the Dark Lord of Middle Earth, who wishes to have the One Ring to rule them all. Justin wishes to control the Nine in order to fight this threat we need to call upon the defenders the wall against which the justin breaks <laughs> thanks ffc for being awesome back to you shane Young. i see you <laughs> wow that was the next that was next level clumping that was amazing. It's that like was. confirmation bias. I got, I got like what? halfway through. I got halfway through that email. And I'm like, I don't even know where we're going with this. And then like all of a sudden, it's like, oh, I see where we're going with this. <laughs> that is some next level spin for. Uh, I am not the Dark Lord. If I'm anyone in that book, I am. If I'm anyone Tom, in that book, Tom. I am uh, Tom Bombadil. Is who I am. <laughs> And at some point, I would have totally said, "What's the Bombadil?" Like, like, <laughs> um, yeah, that was really good. That was a really good. Might be shortlist for the best dispatch ever. <laughs> uh, so there, there, not not much of a question, more of an accusation. But continue. What, yeah, what's the next well, one we got? I uh, um yes from in te- from infested potato. We have, the title is Become the Walls. And 
if you if you haven't heard these, check them out. They're they're pretty awesome. Um, I think Blue actually posts them with an image from time to time in places. I don't yeah, know where they are. I but... have them all on the Facebook uh, photo album, which is also linked oh, cool. on our website. Cool. Facebook is a trap. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> become the walls. Our backs are to the edge of an abyss. That abyss, our extinction. We fought, climbed, and clawed our way off and away from that precarious ledge. We now sit inches from where we began. But here is where we begin again. Humanity and its children ready to reclaim our identity, our destiny. Oops. Those precious few inches are our charge, our reason of being. We were the first to bear that honor. And we'll sh- we shall be there at- till the last, until our watch is no longer needed. When stone shatters and steel melts, our light will hold. When our comrades fall, with their final death but a certainty, our light will hold. When the night draws near and our people need shelter from the cold, feral world, our light will hold. Become the rock and motor. Become the iron and steel. Become the wall. Hold the line. Nice. I think that was supposed to say mortar. I think you're right. And I was going to say mortar, but I had already screwed up one of his lines in the first. And I was like, I'm not going (laughs) to paraphrase anything else. (laughs) So, yeah, that that was really good, Potato. I like that. I, I Yeah. Become the rock and mortar is a really good line. I like his. I really, I really enjoy some of the things he sent in. For- yeah, and He's as chat quite- says, as chat says, our light will hold until Gaul brings the starfish. Under the sea. So we got we got one more, right? Yep, mm-hmm. we got one more. Green, you want to grab that one? Hey, Blue and Crew. This week is the Defender class. Unique to this class is the ability, the Suppressor Grenade. (sighs) Until the introduction of Shadow Shot, this was the only ability to shut down a Guardian's Light. My question to your superior lore brain is this. Game mechanics aside, how do you feel this works? Does the Suppressor Grenade simply use Void Light to disrupt the flow of, of light? Or like a black hole, does this grenade literally consume any light that is used much like a black hole eating light? Side note, can we all just agree that the correct term for the War to Dawn is, is the time out bubble? Thanks, FCC crew. Have a good one. I like I like okay. the time out bubble. Just my two yeah. cents. It kind of <laughs> feels like that because I used to use hula hoops with elementary school kids. And they would have to sit inside the ele- the hula hoop. The problem is, is when you get the really smart ones who picked up the hula hoop and started walking with it. That yeah. Would, that would have been me. That happened to me. <laughs> yeah. I got put the time out. My, my mom said not to pick my butt up off that chair. And my brother and I went all over the house walking around <laughs> with the chairs. And then she was like, you know what I meant? And I said, oh, I clearly did not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then there was a battle. <laughs> Needless a to say, will. Justin did not win that battle. So if if I can respond to this first, I actually, what I was talking about earlier, I think um, the suppressor, not unlike what the Starfish of Death does to the Traveler in the D2 um, homecoming mission, uh, I think the suppressor grenade has a similar effect on your guardian anything that can can, that can disrupt that transmission of light um i i think will mess with your abilities much like a darkness zone it's it's almost like a a you know a little portable darkness zone has been cast upon you it's just interfering with that with that continuous circuit from traveler you know ghost and yourself Isn't there a card that talks about the void you punch through to 
through to the void to pull pull it out, right? The dust bow. Right, the dust bow card. Um, don't they talk about the aspect of the void? Oh, I'm trying to think. It's not annihilation. I'm trying to think of what it negates. Mm-hmm. It is nothingness. Well, it I mean, negates because it's one of the things that Ikora kind of laughs when the defenders are like all squirrely about the the uh, right the um void uh, soul soul Nova bomb. Well, no, because they're talking life steal. Because all the titans are like squirrely about it, and she's like, "Uh, mm-hmm. your shield does the exact same thing." Like, <laughs> guys, come on, it's made from the same stuff. Uh, it's a ne- it's like a negation thing, which you can also see a little bit, especially with you know the helm of Saint fourteen and the Starless Knight perk. It's a negation of an ability, right? You walk into mm-hmm. the bubble, and oh, now you're blind. You your your sight has been negated. Right? Is that the right term for that? Right. I think I think that's right. right. Um, I, I'm just laughing because now every time I, I, even though he has the idea of the black hole in there, now that Justin has said it kind of like covers you, you've and been slimed. I have the idea of getting slimed. Yeah. Purple slime. I I'm I I was, yeah. It's it's a slimer. God, now I'm now I need to go watch, Ghostbusters. Nickelodeon. Ghostbusters. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, I guess Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon has the what was that? Nick at Night. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that brought me back. 90s. Purple, what? Purple, what do you? What are your thoughts on the on the timeout bubble and the um, fun <laughs> fun fun police smoke grenade? Um. Yeah. Well, I, I I just and I was just trying to click around to find that exact quote from Ikora. Um, but that's basically like, where do the Titans think that oh, yeah. their power comes from? It's like, seriously, guys, seriously, what do you? <laughs> it's like, guys. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think, well, I, the fact that it's called Void kind of implies that things get sucked into it because when Void is nothing and therefore it gets filled. Um, so I kind of always had an image of like, the other, the lights from other guardians getting sucked into the void hole that the grenade created. But that might just be me projecting because it's called void. (laughs) It's just the void doesn't necessarily present itself in that way for everything. So it's, it's one of those things like kind of weird. uh I think because void in general not just destiny but like in life void is typically viewed as a in in contrast to in contrast to light right it's like not that's what void is um and usually in our stories and fables the the void or the the nothing or the not is the bad things (laughs) But here we're using it with light, it's, by it's the light. It's misunderstood. It's a misunderstood yeah. teenager. Sure. I Let's guess. go with that. <laughs> or is it? But it, mm-hmm. it does bring to mind um, an old theory that I heard like way back in, in year mm-hmm. one that we are actually the villains because yep. all of our uh, classes are like the what are traditionally the bad guys, you know, like the, the warlocks, titans, the Titans, the warlocks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whereas, whereas the hive was the wizards and the wizards knights. And and the knights the... And... <laughs> yes. It was like, wait, hang um, on, hang on. Yeah. It does kind of make you like, mm, yeah. Um, so it, it is an interesting manipulation of, of concepts to have void light. Like, it doesn't they're kind of like not like the opposite of each other kind of but yet they are yeah because we're using it so yeah because a void i mean a void is basically a completely empty space or completely empty and so to say that something is is filled with a void is a weird 
like yeah. almost it's almost a it's, double negative but it's not it, like it's the same paradox as calling black a color well uh, well that's not well, really a paradox kinda, either it's well no 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 no, no. It's, it's kind of it's the same it's kind of like calling white a color well black is the absence of color well, black the, is the, the combination of all it colors. Depends. White, it de- white, no, yeah. it depends. White is combination. It yeah, depends white. on if you're talking about pigmentation or light. It, exactly. Black pigmentation. pigmentation is pigmentation that seems to reflect no light, but it, that's impossible for pigmentation. But black in, in terms of a black hole is the, the absence of light, is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Black hole is... Much more than just the sum of that, though. Black hole is a action. It is the the compression and annihilation of a star that has com- completely folded in and of itself in so much that it starts to pull everything towards it that even light itself cannot exist within the, the, the event horizon. Um black holes are interesting the idea that void i i still want to view the whole void light as more of a spectrum of light thinking ultraviolet and the different colors that we actually see what if there's a boundary beyond that that void light vibrates at such a way that it does does things that we don't understand because ultraviolet light can function in that we use everyday uses for. I mean, we use ultraviolet light to find things that we probably shouldn't find in teenage boys' room. I mean, there's lots of uses for these kinds of things. What if our actual light, <laughs> void light, is another version of that? I buy it. I mean... <laughs> yeah. This is Same. one of those things that's pure, like, Yes, pure, pure speculation, speculation because mm-hmm. oh yeah, spin foil because completely. video games. Yes, confirmation bias. I want physics to work in this world. <laughs> together as fast as I. Confirmation bias. All right, final comments, shout outs. Purple, lead All the right. charge. Um, I will give my shout out today to one of my other podcasts, Rabbit Hole Radio, because we just did an episode about, um, trying to explain because video games things. <laughs> and I felt that, I it bet was, that was fun. It, it was <laughs> fun. So, um, yeah, they are super awesome. If you like spin foil things, you should come over. I'm terrible at them, but have fun anyway. <laughs> All right. You could be terrible. <laughs> okay, green, so what about you? My shout outs. The first one, I'm going to let Blue queue up this Stop next month. Or, yep, and the interruption <laughs> is perfect. We're, uh, I'm actually going to take my book with me. What what book are we are we doing? Pause. What what do? It... Oh, it paused. <laughs> Pause. <Stop> <laughs> There you go. There you go. Starship Troopers by Heinlein. So make sure you grab that. It's pretty short read. So if you're like, oh, I don't have time to read this one. It's totally worth it. So you really should jump in. I looked at all the quotes and I'm really excited to jump in on this Mm -hmm. one. Uh, Second shout out. I'm going to skip around a little bit in my list. Second shout out actually goes to my wife, which she won't actually watch this. But the reason it goes to my wife is because... With our extra lore topic that we're going to go over next week with Horizon uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, she watched the movie with me earlier and said, I would like to play that game. I think I'd like that game. If any of you know my wife, she is not a video (laughs) gamer at all. Stardew Stardew argues that. Yeah. She's put about. Very pretty game, though. It is. It's the pixels are awesome. Are you talking about Horizon? Yeah, I'm talking about Horizon, but ah, uh, yeah, that one too. Stardew Valley, she's she's put maybe 90 hours in, so that kind of argues it. But 
beyond that, she's never played any video game that I would say is more modern style, where you have to worry about 3D action all the way around, not just a 2D action. So she's looking at wanting to get this. So I went out and she gave me a little bit of extra cash because she's the the money holder in the family because I'm not to be trusted to get a PS4. So I, I actually purchased a PS4 today with Horizon Zero Dawn. So I'm going to play this a little bit. So there's at least one of us on show that is part of the normal cast that's played it before on Wednesday. Wow. Yeah. Shout out to her for wanting to jump in and join the gaming community a tiny that's bit. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And then last one is to pins for not only sending me the most ridiculous gift I've gotten all year long and probably my entire life from anybody. And also for getting my wife on Twitter. So that's you, pretty crazy. Me, my God, <laughs> just so many positive things this week. Wife gets on Twitter. I get a PS4. Pins is awesome. You know, it's good life. It's a what's good a, day. What's a, what's a PS4? You know, it's, it's this thing that I had like to D12. listen to two. To I, had, <laughs> I had to listen to two guys at GameStop explain to me for the for about an hour and a half the difference between a PS4 and a PS4 Pro. Oh my mm. gosh! It's like I really just want the cheaper one because I'm not gonna play it too much. So thanks. <laughs> Which one? Here's here's the difference that matters. Which one's cheaper? Yeah, truth. That's the one I want to go with. Mm-hmm. Justin, what about you? Yeah, because if I'm going to sell my soul, it needs to be for cheap. <laughs> exactly. Um. <laughs> I'm not so, selling my soul, although they did like bash on Microsoft, and I was I was not happy about that. No, no, we're okay. We're okay. Microsoft doesn't need their validation. <laughs> well, right. um, so, so great big old shout out to our lovely guest purple um for (laughs) for joining us once again as always it's it's a pleasure and just so you know i wasn't kidding you are welcome back whenever you want (laughs) as is Uh as is evidence (laughs) yeah as is evidence you You just jump straight on (laughs) (laughs) well now now you're making me feel a little bit insecure i thought this was special to you too um (laughs) so uh you no, guys were my first kidding. ever podcast that's nuts yeah i was on your podcast before i was on any of my own podcasts that is so nice nuts, well i i can just remember being in awe that we had someone from ishtar because even though you guys weren't bungee itself you felt like the establishment <laughs> that's how that's that's Aww. how legit you guys were at the time so i really appreciate and that still are. and yeah. still are and still are, yeah, Thank good. You. But guys, if if you, if you haven't checked them out, definitely check out to the check out the Rabbit Hole Radio and also the Ishtar Collective podcast. And um, if you just checked out all the Destiny podcasts, you'd probably listen to all the podcasts that Purple's on. Um, <laughs> but you're you're actually on the Lorecast as well, are you not? Yeah, Destiny Lorecast, Ishtar yeah. Collective, and Rabbit Hole Radio. Those are okay. my podcasts. Okay. And then when she's not podcasting, she um, herds dogs through her. She's an awesome mother. <laughs> and it's Aww. awesome. Um, my next shout out goes to someone pretty special um, who is Private Roger Young of the 148th Infantry. Um, Roger Young was actually killed um, April 28th, 1918. I mean, sorry. Uh, July 31st, 1943, assaulting an enemy uh, entrenchment on the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. And uh, you might ask, why do we care about this? It's because his his gallantry and his bravery led a certain ship to be named after him that's in a certain book that I hope everyone reads in the coming month. What's the name of the book, Blue? That is the biggest, yes. biggest wind up for that. <laughs> it's like, and it's like where, are we, say, where are we going? All with I this? can say, <laughs> all I can say, is shines the name, shines the name of Roger Young. 
<laughs> if you read Starship from? Troopers, that yeah. If if Star oh. you read Starship Troopers, you will know what I'm talking about. It's it's yeah. It's it's pretty much one of the most beloved ships in all sci-fi. Right up there with Serenity and the Millennium yeah, Falcon. It, I just threw that down. No, it's that's kind of accurate. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, if you have the, I, I have a special edition of uh, Starship Troopers, and I, the other paperback I had of it didn't have it, but there's actually a, a historical note in the back of it that oh, tells wow. the whole story. Hel- tells the whole story of of Private Roger Young, who actually he was. Um, his whole unit was pinned down by this, what they called a pill box, which was a, a concrete reinforced uh, machine gun nest. And he crawled to assault it by himself and was wounded and kept crawling and was wounded and kept crawling, kept, and he got close enough that he took out the whole pill box with grenades before <laughs> he was killed. And that's why he had a whole freaking spaceship named after him. So read Starship Troopers. Do it. <laughs> I, I don't know, Justin. I don't. I don't know if I can. I can best that shout out. <laughs> um, our next next week's topic is going to be a dive into the lore of Dead Orbit. So be sure to email us any thoughts, questions, insults, because that's pretty much all that is chat this week. I've I've been very patient with all you heathens, um, and uh, we also are accepting that over on Twitter at hashtag Ask. FFC, which apparently, by the way, has been trying to hijack by some random church. I don't really know where that came from, but yeah, that that's that's apparently their hashtag as well. So don't feel weird oh. if you ever look that up. Um, it's better than some of the alternatives that we were trying. Uh, and then a big shout out to <laughs> a big shout out to our subs and our patrons over on Twitch and Podbean, uh, Bell Bunny, Guardian06, and then Pins for the resub on Twitch. We appreciate your guys' support, as Good always. Um, but yeah, so let's run through the outro and then stick around for a bit of an after show. With that, we'll begin to wrap the chat up. Thank you again to those over on Twitch for coming to spend your evening with us. If you'd like to join us for the live streaming of the episodes each week, please be sure to give us a follow over on twitch.tv slash focusfirechat. Links to all our other sites can also be found with our episode archives over on the new and improved www.focusfirechat.com. Thank you again, Purple, for joining in on the conversation. I'll be sure to get your contact information up in our show notes for anyone who wants to continue chatting with you. Please be sure to email us at focusfirechat at gmail.com with any feedback or questions for our team concerning the podcast, and let us know how we're doing by giving us some feedback on iTunes as well. Also, make sure to check out our partner podcast within the Guardian Radio Network over on theguardiansofdestiny.com. So, until next time... Focus your fire and may your light shine bright.